Hey dudes, and welcome to today's video. Today is video number nine in my 10 part series on pregnancy and infant loss awareness. And today is actually the last video I'm making in this series that will include introducing you to another mother's story. And that is because the last video I'm making, which is video that will go up on Wednesday, is the much requested follow up to what not to say to a grieving parent. I have done a lot of changing in my own grief journey. I've also done a lot more listening and getting feedback and I definitely think that it's time to redo that video and just, you know, also make sure that we're giving more tips of what to say to a grieving parent. So please watch for that on Wednesday. To jump into the video today, it took me quite a while to find someone who could do this topic with me because there's not a whole lot of families who are raising an only child who is not an only child and are actively out sharing their story. Many of the lost moms that I have met have either have already have multiple living children or have living children but are planning on trying to have more living children as well. So this topic didn't quite suit any of their personal situations. So I actually turned to one of my lost groups on Facebook and I was really happy and excited that I could do this partnership with Rebecca. Rebecca is the admin of one of my most favorite groups on Facebook for mothers who are grieving the loss of their children and this group has like seriously been one of the most amazing things and one of the most helpful things during my grief journey so far so I was really excited that I could do this collaboration with Rebecca. So I'm gonna go ahead and let Rebecca jump in and share her story with you and then I'll pick it up from there. My name is Rebecca Wood. I'm the author of the blog One Pink Balloon. My daughter Kenley Evelyn Wood was born on February 25th 2013 at 36 weeks. She was still born due to a wrapped and kinked cord and uh, my journey from that day to today has been a very long and arduous one and will continue to be one. I'm here to talk to you about what it's like raising an only who's not an only as I have a second daughter named Piper who was born in 2014 and she's four and a half. What brought us to raising just one living child? When Piper was born we were up in the air. We weren't entirely sure if we were going to have more kids. We really hadn't made that decision. When Kenley was born still, I knew immediately I'm going to have more kids. But Piper's pregnancy was very difficult emotionally. Uh, physically, both of them were difficult. I do not do pregnancy well. I swell. I have a lot of nausea. I have a lot of acid reflux, blood pressure issues. I just feel terrible physically. And then uh, mentally, a rainbow pregnancy is extremely difficult. Just constantly worried about losing her at every second. It just There's just so many emotions, so uh, a second pregnancy after a loss is, is very difficult. So we just kind of weren't at that place yet. As kind of time went on, as she was, as she was you know, growing up and, and things like that, we, we just kind of thought, well, you know, we'll, we'll get there. We'll start trying eventually. And then my husband kind of expressed, he, he was satisfied with just having Having Piper, he didn't want to have to go through that worry again to try to get another one and just to lose again. When Kenley was born, I had the advanced maternal age stamp on my folder. And when Piper was born, I got the geriatric maternal age stamp. And uh, I'm 40 and she's four and a half. And I think just by default, we have fallen into not having more children. It's, it's just not it's just not gonna be conducive for our family. How do I keep Kenley in Piper's life? Kenley has really always been in Piper's life from day one. I've always worn a necklace, this one's an owl. I have like run Kenley run necklaces, necklaces with her name on it, K's, things like that. We've always kind of just talked about how she has a, a sister in the, in the stars, as we have put it. When Piper was one, we got a Kenley bear from Build-A-Bear and it has her heartbeat in it which I, I love this. And um, we gave it to Piper, and when she was small, because she got up when she was one, um, she would crawl into her tent, and she would push the little heartbeat button, and it would soothe her, and it would soothe me, and, um, and I loved that. 
she knows she has an older sister in the stars. I do memorial walks. I run uh, the Princess Half Marathon and various other things in Kinley's honor, and Piper knows all that. Um, it really hasn't been anything that, that we've had to introduce. It's just kind of always been there. When she was really little, she wanted to be a helicopter pilot so that she could go up into the stars to see Kenley. Now that she's four and a half, we're kind of starting to introduce a more realistic uh, image of death and how it's, you know, it's permanent. You don't come back from it. She now wants to be an astronaut. She wanted to be an astronaut for about two years now. And I want to think that that's because of science and uh, not because she wants to go go see her sister. But, you know, that's kind of just something that we work on. And, and, you know, talking about death with young children, that's a difficult thing. The questions that Piper asked were, you know, can I go visit her in the stars? Um, she often wants to know, did she die? How did she die? Things like that. Uh, is she coming back? And th those are really the things that she's into now. And we just kind of address them as no, she's not coming back. You know, she's gone forever. And she kind of is accepting of that. She doesn't really ask a huge amount of questions because she is only four and a half. When people ask me if Piper is my only child, this one is a really hard question for me um, because normally people just are strangers in Target or at the zoo and they're just seeing Piper playing or whatever and they'll say, is she your only child? And um, I panic and I always say yes. And I hate that. It brings me a lot of grief. It brings me a lot of of guilt because she's not my only child. But I, I don't know really what else to say because is this really a conversation that I wanna have with a stranger who's just complimenting my family that, oh no, I, I do have another child and she's dead and let me make you feel bad about that. It's not really a conscious decision either, it's just something that comes out. And I really wish I could come up with a better way to, to say that. Sometimes I just say, no, she's not. Um, sometimes I just say she has an older sister and most people just kind of leave it at that and they don't keep prying. On those occasions when I am brave enough to say, no, she's, this is not my only, um, and they still keep pushing and they find out that I do have a, a child that has died, um, I guess in that moment, I'm just like, well, you get what you get. If you, if you wanna, if you wanna keep pressing a stranger about personal things, then you know, you're gonna be uncomfortable and that's just the way it's gonna be. What do I want others to understand about raising an only who's not an only? Is that the hardest thing for me right now, six and almost six years out, is sibling relationships. You know, when you first lose a baby, you, you have a hard time seeing babies or pregnant women. And now the hard thing for me is seeing sisters. Sisters is really difficult for me. I think because I have a sister, Piper, Piper is a sister, and uh, you know, I, we go to Disney or the zoo or, or things like that, and I see these little girls dressed up you know, together in, in little sibling outfits. And it's really difficult for me to see them holding hands and playing with each other. And I, I know siblings fight. I had a sister growing up. I know they fight. I know that it's, it's uh, uh, you know, not all roses and sunshine, but um, watching siblings is really difficult for me. And I think that, you know, people see this complete little family with one child and and they they don't see, you know, what's missing, but I know that she's that she's always missing. And, and not only am I missing my baby, but she's missing her sister. And so that relationship that she doesn't have is very difficult. How do I respond when people ask why I'm not giving her a, another sibling? Well, you know, giving, she's not, it's not mine to give. We don't give our children siblings. We, we have children because we want to have more children. And that was, that was a struggle for me for a while too of deciding whether or not I wanted to have more kids because it got to the point where the only reason I would have another child was for Piper and for Piper to have a sibling growing up with her. And uh, ultimately, that's not the right reason to have another baby. Um, you have another baby because you want another baby, because you want to extend your family and take care of another baby and things like that. And just to simply give your living child another living sibling is not, to me, the right reason to have more children. What happens if she asks for one? Uh, she hasn't asked for one yet. Uh, she has a lot of other uh, friends that have younger sisters and brothers, and she hasn't asked at all. I think when she does ask, if she does ask, um, I will just say, well, honey, you know, that's that's not our family. All families are different, and we're going to, you know, we have you, and we have Kinley, and that's our, that's our family. That's who we have. 
and uh, it's got to be enough. And and I know that there's a stigma surrounding only children, and they think that they're spoiled, and they think that they, they're lonely and things like that. And I tell you, my kid is not lonely. She has tons of friends. She has grandmas and grandpas. She has me, my husband. She has our big doofy mutt, Darwin. She has a lot of people who love her and around her, and she is not a lonely child. Uh, those are the questions that I have been asked to answer. I hope I've answered them appropriately. Thanks for watching. Thanks for learning a little bit about my family and um, my only who's not an only. Thanks. I seriously, <laughs> I say this every video, but I am always so glad to get to know the people that I'm partnering on each topic with, getting to know them even more because there are some amazing women in this community and I just am so glad and grateful that they are so willing to share their stories and you know, willing to do this series with me because it has been such a learning experience and it has just been really an amazing experience for me this month. One thing that I absolutely adored that Rebecca said is you know, if her daughter asks for a younger sibling, what will her response be? And for her to say that her response is that every family is different, I love that. I haven't gotten to that point where I've needed to consider what to say to Mallory yet. And to hear Rebecca know what she would say to her daughter has just like been like, oh my gosh, okay, I love that. I want to make sure I mentally remember that because that's such a beautiful way to basically summarize everything because every family is so different and no family really looks the same. And so I think that's just like the absolute perfect answer and I'm so glad that she shared that. To kind of rewind for those of you who may not know our situation, my husband and I, when we first got married, had initially talked about wanting two children and we came up with one boy name, one girl name. And those are just kind of the, you know, the two children that we had envisioned in our fairy tale life. And through our little journey, we struggled with infertility and just different scenarios. We tried losing weight. We tried meeting with a fertility doctor and you know we couldn't really go very far down that process because our insurance at the time didn't fund it. So it just was a struggle for us and after a certain amount of time we just decided you know what maybe kids aren't in our future let's just embrace that. I even actually went and got therapy <laughs> and discussed with my therapist different ways that I can accept and deal with the fact that I would not be having a child. And two years after accepting this as fact, I found out that I was pregnant and it was obviously an unplanned pregnancy, but we were delighted and we kind of changed our life around again. And unfortunately at 26 weeks, we lost our son to a brain bleed. After that, we were faced with what do we do? You know, we were 34 and 36 years old, so we knew that if we wanted to try for that second child that we had always planned on, that we would probably have to do it sooner rather than later because it took seven years to get our son. And so we tried again and actually got pregnant immediately with our daughter. And her pregnancy on paper was textbook perfect. Unfortunately, if you knew me in person or if you watched our vlogs at that time, I was very stressed out. Before even losing our son from issues from earlier in my life, I had been diagnosed with anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder. And <clears throat> when we lost our son, it just kind of amplified and added more layers to those two diagnoses. Having my pregnancy with my daughter, I just mentally wasn't as strong as I wish I could have been. And, you know, even once she got here, I was so terrified that I would still lose her. Talking to my OB, we just kind of were discussing it, my husband and I were discussing it, and ultimately the choice between my husband and I was that we just think that we're done. And I, when my daughter first came out of, when they, because I had her C-section, so when she first came out of me, I, just felt this overwhelming sense of contentment. That seems to be just the best word. I always say our family isn't whole because we're missing our son, but we are complete and we decided not to have any more children. There's such a layer of guilt on that because I do have so many friends who struggle with infertility. I do have so many friends who are in the lost community who really want to have a living child or another living child and they're struggling for 
many different reasons and so it's kind of hard because you don't know if I would we just don't know if I'd be able to have another child or if I would struggle again but in either case we had initially only ever said two kids and we reached that goal and so I had to I had to just put the guilt and those those kind of background things in my head and just decide what was best for our family and our situation when we announced that that was our decision one of the most common comments that were negative negative that we got were just a lot of questions and curiosity of why we would do that to Mallory and not give her a younger sibling and it's kind of hard because like, like Rebecca said how do you make a decision based off of a hypothetical feeling your child may or may not have I have several friends who are only children and they love it I have other friends who are only children and they hate it I have friends who have many, many siblings and they hate that. I have other friends who love it. And so it's just kind of like, how do you, how do you use that hypothetical potential feeling in deciding? And you just can't. You have to do what's best for your family in that moment. And that was our decision. We got several comments that said we were selfish and that, you know, when Tyson and I got older, it would, all the responsibility would fall onto Mallory's shoulders to take care of us and when we were gone she'd be left alone you know my dad has siblings but they all live across the country and when my grandma was sick it all fell on his shoulders and he took that responsibility and he cared for my grandma until she passed away and he had siblings but it was still the vast majority was on his shoulders so it kind of like well that didn't matter but something that did kind of shape my opinion in watching that is I never want it to be an assumption of mine that my daughter will take care of me when I'm ill. If that's something she chooses and you know together we decide that that is what's going to happen then that's one thing but I don't want to assume that and I want to make sure that I live my life in a way that I have a plan to either be in like a care center or to just I don't know just be in a facility and not put that responsibility on my daughter especially just because she's an only child only living child. I'm also a big believer that family is not just blood. I believe that you can make friends and loved ones your family. And so I hope that as, you know, Mallory continues to grow, that as she's younger, that we put people in her life that will be there for her. And as she gets older, that she chooses people to be in her life that will be an amazing support system for her. And I hope that she has a significant other or a loved one in her life so that she will have someone. Even if she had a sibling, there's just no guarantee that they will be close or anything like that. And after having Mallory, it was just like, I don't want to produce a sibling for her just to produce a sibling for her. I would love for her to have Beckett and have her older brother, but I don't feel that just giving her a sibling is what's right for our family. So that's how we came to the conclusion that we were not going to be having any more children, long story short. Keeping Beckett in Mallory's life has been an interesting series of events. I want to make sure that we keep a good balance because I want her to be able to know about Beckett, but I also don't want to make it overwhelming for her or you know, make it seem like she will ever fall to Beckett's shadow, which is one of the reasons why we personally choose not to use the term rainbow baby. Uh, we don't want Beckett and Mallory to have any ties or labels together other than brother and sister. I don't want Beckett to be on a pedestal and someone that Mallory is constantly having to live live for or to even have to like be perfect because he's not here if that makes any sense. Mallory is her own person and Beckett was his own person. So I just try to, you know, he's in her life in the way that we just talk about him. If there's ever a time where Mallory is just not acting like she's comfortable talking about Beckett or being involved in any of the things with Beckett's memory like his birthday or the wave of light, those kind of things that we do, then I will never force Mallory to participate in those. Grieving Beckett is something that is for Tyson and I and if Mallory chooses to be involved in that then I think that's fantastic, that is her brother, but Mallory also gets to choose how she grieves 
and if she wants to grieve. So I don't have any plans to force her to do that. And as of right now, I don't, you know, like show her pictures and say this is Beckett. There are pictures around the house and if she points to them, I will say that's Beckett. But I typically try to just keep the balance and at this age in her life, there's just really no reason to you know, be talking to her about him every day, but we don't keep him from her at the same time. I definitely don't want her to feel like she can't talk about him or that she can't feel like she can have any certain feelings about him. I want to make sure that we have open communication and that she feels comfortable with whichever direction she wants to go. When people ask if Mallory's an only child, it's so hard because physically she is an only child. You know, as far as appearances, there's no other children for us to compare. And so it's every day is a different situation and I just kind of like assess the situation. Usually if we're in a hurry, I just quickly say yes. The majority of the time I do respond with that she is our only living child and that typically gives people the idea of what's going on. Sometimes I do say she has a big brother but we just you know we try not to go into too many details in the situation unless it's someone who will obviously be in our life a little bit more than just for 10 seconds in passing and then you know if that's the situation and it's appropriate we go into that more but it does as a lost mama, it does kind of tug on your heart a little when you do say that they're an only child because, you know, they're not. And it's up to Mallory how she chooses to respond to that again. Like, I really don't want to put any expectations on her. If in the future she starts drawing pictures of our family and it's just Tyson, me, and her, then I think that's fantastic. And I will hang that picture on our fridge and be so proud of it because, one, I can't wait till she's drawing pictures. But, two, that is her representation of our family, and I'm totally fine with that. I choose to incorporate Beckett in some sort of way, but that's me and I don't expect Mallory to take that on and it's just, it's a complicated situation so it's kind of hard when people ask that question. <laughs> it definitely sends your brain into panic mode but I typically, you know, just kind of, like I said, just say she's our only living child and that answers the question. What I mostly want people to understand about raising an only child who's not an only child is it's okay for your family to be a little bit different. I have a friend who has a daughter who is a couple months older than Mallory and she also has two older sons who through life circumstances she does not have custody of those boys. They live with their father and they live across the country so her daughter actually, I don't think she's even met her older brothers, but she still talks to her daughter about her older brothers and that's socially acceptable. But unfortunately in our situation, and I'm not trying to say, you know, children who haven't met their siblings, it's the same as the lost. No, they're two totally completely different situations. I don't pretend that I understand this situation and I know they don't pretend to understand ours, but you know, I do find it interesting that it's socially acceptable to talk about a sibling in that situation, but not so much ours. And so what I just wish people could understand is it's okay to talk about someone that passed away. There is a balance. You definitely don't want to constantly be only in that zone where you can only think about the person in your life that you lost, but it's okay to have a discussion around that. It's okay for Mallory to know that she has an older brother. It's okay for her to know that even at a young age, it's okay. It's just all about finding the balance and understanding what is best for her in that moment and what's appropriate in that moment. So anyway, it's all about navigation and just continual reassessment and trying to decide and we're just kind of trying to figure out these muddy waters as we go through it and hopefully as Mallory gets older she will understand too and we just want to keep that line of communication open with her. That is our goal, that is our plan and hopefully it works out that way. Life never goes to plan but you know. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and end this very long video here. Thank you guys so much for watching this. If you have anything you want to say to us, please let us know down in the comments and we will respond. Thank you so much for all your love and support. We love your bums and we will see you next time.